Hey folks, um, Mr. Howard here. We're going to do chapter 8 of Animal Farm. Uh, last time we did chapter 7, which included that horrifying purge allegory, where Napoleon decided that he was going to um, get rid of everybody who opposed him, like those pigs who stood up and uh, objected when Snowball was run off, and then again objected about the uh, whole egg affair, and the chickens that organized the egg rebellion, you know, and all those animals that opposed him in any way, he has massacred them all, leaving behind only sort of the docile animals, the ones that didn't ever um, resist his rule. And so essentially what we have here is Orwell showing us through Napoleon's power grab um, what happens when a dictator takes over uh, a country. Remember, the country is theoretically um, communist or animalist, and, um, you know, clearly Orwell is trying to say something about people, people in power. We've talked about thematically, you know, maybe what this what the story is about how you know for years and years this was touted as a story that was anti-communist and about you know like the the negative repercussions of of communism um but you know I, I think that maybe that's that's informed a little bit by the cold war and what we we're going through um you know orwell seems to be saying here that people are terrible and and when you look at all like the end of the last chapter when you're looking at um clover and what she's saying about why they had the rebellion and what they were hoping to achieve um you know that's glorious and and uh powerful and meaningful right before the squealer shows up and tells them to um that the singing of beasts of england has been abolished um but you know what what's the reality the reality is that if everybody was boxer if everybody was going to work hard um that communist vision might be achievable might be perfect but unfortunately we've got napoleons in this world we got people who are power hungry people who um you know are not good and do not have the best interests of other people at heart and you know here's here's where the the point comes out so you know at the end of the day we have to we have to make some decision about what orwell is trying to say here and um is it is it simply that communism is bad or is it something more about humanity and the human condition um, and maybe this chapter will help, you know, bring some clarity on that. So anyway, I'm going to pick up on chapter eight and uh, we'll keep reading and uh, find out what's going on on Animal Farm this time. A few days later, when the terror caused by the executions had died down, some of the animals remembered or thought they remembered that the sixth commandment decreed no animal shall kill any other animal. And though no one cared to mention it in the hearing of the pigs or the dogs, it was felt that the killings which had taken place did not square with this. Clover asked Benjamin to read her the Sixth Commandment, and Benjamin, as usual, said that he refused to meddle in such matters. She fetched Muriel. Muriel read the commandment for her. It ran, No animal shall kill any other animal without cause. Somehow or other, the last two words had slipped out of the animal's memory. But they saw now that the commandment had not been violated, for clearly there was good reason for killing the traitors who had leagued themselves with Snowball. Pause. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't take us very much to go back and look at those commandments and realize that the commandment was, no animal shall kill any other animal, and that the without cause seems to have been added at the end. But the animals can't remember this uh, or prove this because they can't read and write. And so the people who are in control of uh, reading and writing control history um you know control the laws control all of that kind of stuff and so again the the under theme of the importance of education uh comes across really clearly it's very easy to manipulate a society of uneducated people uh throughout the year the animals worked even harder than they had worked in the previous year i i do recall that the previous year the simile we used was that the animals worked like slaves so what are we saying here um to rebuild the windmill with walls twice as thick as before and to finish it by the appointed date together with the regular work of the farm was a tremendous labor. There were times when it seemed to the animals that they worked longer hours and were fed no better than they had done in Jones's day. On Sunday morning, Squealer, holding down a long strip of paper with his trotter, would read out to them lists of figures proving that the production of every class of foodstuffs had increased by 200%, 300%, or 500%, as the case might be. The animals saw no reason to disbelieve him, especially as they could no longer remember very clearly what the conditions had been like before the rebellion. 
all the same, there were days when they felt that they would sooner have less figures and more food. Again, go back and, and look for the allegory here. This is something that very clearly happened in communist Russia. Um, you know, people who were put in charge of things would report better results than they had so that they wouldn't get in trouble. Um, you know, and, and do they have more food than they had before? Clearly, the animals aren't eating any better than they did in Jones's day. But Squealer's telling them that they have more, and I guess that's good enough. All orders were now issued through Squealer or one of the other pigs. Napoleon himself was not seen in public as often as once in a fortnight. When he did appear, he was attended not only by his retinue of dogs, but by a black cockerel who marched in front of him and acted as a kind of trumpeter, letting out a large cock before Napoleon spoke. Even in the farmhouse, it was said, Napoleon inhabited separate apartments from the others. He took his meals alone with two dogs to wait upon him and always ate from the Crown Derby dinner service, which had been in the glass cupboard in the drawing room. It was also announced that the gun would be fired every year on Napoleon's birthday, as well as on the other two anniversaries. Pause. Why is Orwell giving us these details here? What is this saying about Napoleon? Uh, hopefully you're seeing that he's becoming more king-like. You know, he's above even the other pigs now. He, he eats in a different place. He lives in a different place. Uh, he's got guards. He's got a, he's got a, you know, rooster that, that announces when he's going to talk. Um, now his birthday is a national holiday. You know, you just go through and look at this and you can see Napoleon becoming more and more like a king. Uh, so much for all animals are equal. Napoleon was now never spoken of simply as Napoleon. He was always referred to in a formal, formal style as our leader, Comrade Napoleon. And this, pigs like to invent for him such titles as father of all animals, terror of mankind, protector of the sheepfold, duckling's friend, and the like. In his speeches, Squealer would talk with tears rolling down his cheeks of Napoleon's wisdom, the goodness of his heart, and the deep love he bore to all animals everywhere, even and especially the unhappy animals who still lived in ignorance and slavery on other farms. It had become usual to give Napoleon the credit for every successful achievement and every stroke of good fortune. He would often hear one hen remark to another, under the guidance of our leader, comrade Napoleon, I have laid five eggs in six days. Or two cows enjoying a drink at the pool would exclaim, Thanks to the leadership of Comrade Napoleon, how excellent this water tastes. The general feeling on the farm was well expressed in a poem entitled Comrade Napoleon, which was composed by Minimus and which ran as follows. Now, you remember how we did some analysis of um, Beasts of England because Orwell bothered to write the whole song for us. Well, here Orwell has bothered to write us an entire poem um, that Minimus, one of the pigs, uh, has written about Napoleon. And if he's taken the time to write it, we should take the time to analyze it. There's going to be some symbolic stuff in here. But let's, let's just read it once first, and then we'll go back and analyze it. Friend of the fatherless fountain of happiness, Lord of the swill bucket, oh, how my soul is on fire when I gaze at thy calm and commanding eye, like the sun in the sky, comrade Napoleon. Thou art the giver of all thy creatures love, full belly twice a day, clean straw to roll upon, every beast, great or small, sleeps at peace in his stall, thou watchest over all, comrade Napoleon. Had I a sucking pig, ere he had grown as big, even as a pint bottle or as a rolling pin, he should have learned to be faithful and true to thee. Yes, his first squeak should be, Comrade Napoleon. Okay, so let's take a look at this thing. Um, we start out with friend of the fatherless. Um, we're saying that Napoleon is your friend, he's your surrogate father figure, you're all sort of adopted children of him fountain of happiness uh this idea that all of the happiness in every animal's life is coming directly from napoleon like he's a wellspring um they're all drinking their happiness from him um then we call him the lord of the swill bucket lord of lord of food now that's an interesting line though because lord a lord is somebody who lives in a manor the farm used to be called manor farm what's what's going on here oh how my soul is on fire when i gaze at your calm and commanding eye uh, this idea that Napoleon's calm, he's he's peaceful, uh, he's also commanding, he's in charge, but it's almost like a worship of God here. Like the sun in the sky. Look at the simile. Napoleon is like the sun. Um, it is it is sort of a God worship uh, moment here. And we call him Comrade Napoleon. 
Uh, but remember that comrade means means sort of friend and equal. Um, is Napoleon a friend and an equal of the animals here? Uh, what's changed in the way that they use the word comrade? Then uh, we go thou. Now, by the way, I, I should mention here that throughout this, we've got thys and thous. That's religious language. You see that in the Bible. You know, uh, we we use more modern language. Um, instead of I gaze at thy common commanding eye, we say your. Um, and you are the giver of all that your creatures love, but it's thou are the giver of all that thy creatures love. So again, um, this sort of godlike reverence and, and biblical language in reference to Napoleon. Uh, and the kinds of things that, that they uh, credit to Napoleon, full belly twice a day, clean straw to roll upon, the only reason you're able to eat, the only reason you're able to sleep, have these basic human functions is Napoleon. Every beast, great or small, sleeps at peace in his own stall. We have peace because of Napoleon. You watch over all, and that's, you know, another sort of godlike image, but maybe a little bit of disturbing um, stuff here, like a subtext. Uh, Napoleon's always watching. He's always got his eye on you. He knows what's good. He knows what's bad. Um, you know, and maybe there's something to be said there about the police in Russia and the, the way that they uh, monitored people. Last one is, I think, the most disturbing of the verses. Had I a sucking pig, that's a little baby pig. Before he had grown as big, even as a pint bottle or a rolling pin, he should have learned to be faithful and true to thee. The most important thing animals can teach their kids is to be faithful and true to Napoleon. Yes, his first squeak should be Comrade Napoleon. It, it's right and proper that the first thing babies should say is comrade napoleon rather than mommy or daddy um you know that makes napoleon sort of the mother and father figure of the entire farm um, and the thing to which they owe more loyalty than to their own family uh, so like when you actually take the time to analyze this song it's a pretty disturbing um lessons and, and underlying things about what's going on on animal farm in general all right let's move on Napoleon approved of this poem and caused it to be inscribed on the wall of the big barn at the opposite end from the Seven Commandments. It was surmounted by a portrait of Napoleon in profile, executed by Squealer in white paint. Again, so one side of the barn has the Seven Commandments on it, the other has this thing, which is sort of a brainwashing, turning Napoleon into God. And there's a picture of Napoleon above that on the barn itself, which, you know, actually, if, if you know anything about communist Russia, it was sort of expected that every house in the entire country would have a picture of Stalin inside. Um, and of course, when a new leader ascended to the throne, that new leader's picture was put up. And one of the things that I think is, is absolutely incredible about uh, Animal Farm, it was, it was written in, in 1945, and the way that it applies to North Korea, which wasn't even a thing at the time, uh, is really amazing. You know, like when you look at all this stuff, our leader, Comrade Napoleon, and the, the portraits and, you know, like all of it, uh, it's very apt. It's very um, sort of spot on. It's almost like a prophecy. Uh, so that's that's worth checking out, too, if anybody wants to do some research um, on that. But let's, let's keep going here. Um, meanwhile, through the agency of Wimper, pause, you guys remember who Wimper is? He's the solicitor. He's the lawyer, the human um, that the the farm you know works through napoleon was engaged in complicated negotiations with frederick and pilkington remember frederick is hitler of nazi germany and pilkington is churchill of england um, in the allegory the pile of timber was still unsold of the two frederick was the more anxious to get hold of it but he would not offer a reasonable price at the same time they were renewed rumors that frederick and his men were plotting to attack animal farm and to destroy the windmill the building of which had aroused furious jealousy in him. Snowball was known to still be skulking on Pinchfield Farm. In the middle of the summer, the animals were alarmed to hear that three hens had come forward and confessed that, inspired by Snowball, they had entered into a plot to murder Napoleon. They were executed immediately, and fresh precautions for Napoleon's safety were taken. Four dogs guarded his bed at night, one at each corner and a young pig named pink eye was given the task of tasting all of his food before he ate it lest it should be poisoned pause napoleon's getting paranoid why is he getting paranoid what's he afraid of you know this is this is the question his own animals um if this was a perfect utopia why would the animals consider poisoning him or trying to kill him off 
At about the same time, it was given out that Napoleon had arranged to sell the pile of timber to Mr. Pilkington. He was also going to enter into a regular agreement for the exchange of certain products between Animal Farm and Foxwood. The relations between Napoleon and Pilkington, though they were only conducted through Whimper, were now almost friendly. The animals distrusted Pilkington as a human being, but greatly preferred him to Frederick, whom they both feared and hated. As the summer wore on and the windmill neared completion, the rumors of an impending treacherous attack grew stronger and stronger. Frederick, it was said, intended to bring against them 20 men all armed with guns, and he had already bribed the magistrates and police so that if he could once get hold of the title deeds of Animal Farm, they would ask no questions. Moreover, terrible stories were leaking out from Pinchfield about the cruelties that Frederick practiced upon his animals. He had flogged an old horse to death. He starved his cows. He had killed a dog by throwing it into the furnace. He amused himself in the evenings by making cocks fight with splinters of razor blade tied to their spurs. The animals' blood boiled with rage when they heard of these things being done to their comrades, and sometimes they clamored to be allowed to go out in a body and attack Pinchfield Farm, drive out the humans, and set the animals free. But Squealer counseled them to avoid rash actions and trust in Comrade Napoleon's strategy. Pause. Okay, so Frederick, remember in our allegory, is Hitler of Nazi Germany. Look at this, all the horrible things that are supposedly happening on, on Pinchfield Farm. Um, you know, uh, remember animals represent workers, they represent the poor. Um, okay, so the animals on, on Animal Farm are concerned that Frederick is, is getting ready to invade them. Now, obviously, you know, Hitler does invade Russia, so, you know, they, they have a reason to be concerned. Uh, but listen to the terrible stories leaking out from Pinchfield. Um, he had flogged an old horse to death. That means whipped an old horse to death. He starved his cows. He killed a dog by throwing it in the furnace. You know, like, this is, I guess, sort of funny until you realize what they're talking about allegorically, throwing a dog into the furnace. I mean, clearly, we're talking about the, the Holocaust here, right? Uh, he amused himself in the evenings by making cocks fight with splinters of razor blade tied to their spurs. So, you know, the animals in Animal Farm want to go set the animals of, of uh, Pinchfield free, but um, Squealer tells them not to. Uh, avoid rash actions and trust Comrade Napoleon's strategy. Nevertheless, feeling against Frederick continued to run high. One Sunday morning, Napoleon approached the barn and explained that he had never at any time contemplated selling the pile of timber to Frederick. He considered it beneath his dignity, he said, to have dealings with scoundrels of that description. There's some great vocab in this chapter, by the way, if you're looking to do your vocab. Um, the pigeons, who were still sent out to spread tidings of the rebellion, were forbidden to set foot anywhere on Foxwood, and were also ordered to drop their former slogan of death to humanity in favor of death to Frederick. In the late summer, yet another of Snowball's machinations, see, I told you, great, great vocab, was laid bare. The wheat crop was full of weeds, and it was discovered that on one of his nocturnal visits, Snowball had mixed weed seeds in with the seed corn. A gander who had been privy to the plot had confessed his guilt to Squealer and immediately committed suicide by swallowing deadly nightshade berries. The animals now also learned that Snowball had never, as many of them had believed hitherto, received the order of Animal Hero First Class. This was merely a legend which had been spread sometime after the Battle of the Cowshed by Snowball himself. So far from being decorated, he had been censured for showing cowardice in the battle. Once again, some of the animals heard this with a certain bewilderment, but Squealer was soon able to convince them that their memories had been at fault. Again, more information about the importance of being literate, being able to read and write, and thereby know what really happened and what didn't happen. But uh, we should also mention here that Snowball is still being blamed for everything that went wrong. Did Snowball really come and mix um, weed seed into the seed corn and thereby fill the, fill the field with weeds? What evidence do we have to support that? It seems more likely, based on what we've seen so far, that the pigs screwed up, and instead of taking the blame themselves, they're blaming Snowball because that's easy. And in fact, when you look at what's been going on here, they have this handy scapegoat in Snowball, um, apparently a, a gander um, who knew all about the plot, like confessed and then committed suicide. How handy is that? Like, what evidence do you have that that actually happened? Squealer just said so, right? So they just wanted to kill this goose, and then they blamed the goose for the weeds. 
you know, like that, that could very well be what actually happened. But we never know because we don't have the ability to read and write as animals here. Um, so, you know, like that's, that's definitely going on. But rewind to the beginning of the chapter. And in contrast to Snowball, who gets blamed for anything that goes wrong in any way, whenever anything goes right, like you lay five eggs or the water tastes good, it's Napoleon who is um, getting the credit for every good thing and Snowball who's getting the blame for every bad thing. Um, in autumn, by a tremendous exhausting effort, for the harvest had to be gathered at almost the same time, the windmill was finished. The machinery had still to be installed and Wimper was negotiating the purchase of it, but the structure was completed. In the teeth of every difficulty, in spite of inexperience, of primitive implements, of bad luck, and of Snowball's treachery, the work had been finished punctually to the very day. Tired out, but proud, the animals walked round and round their masterpiece, which appeared even more beautiful in their eyes than when it had been built the first time. Moreover, the walls were twice as thick as before. Nothing short of explosives would lay them low this time. Is that foreshadowing? And when they thought of how they had labored, what discouragements they had overcome, and the enormous difference that would be made in their lives when the sails were turning and the dynamos running, when they thought of all this, their tiredness forsook them, and they gambled round and round the windmill, uttering cries of triumph. Napoleon himself, attended by his dogs and his cockerel, came down to inspect the completed work. He personally congratulated the animals on their achievement and announced that the mill would be named Napoleon Mill. How much work did he put into it? Two days later, the animals were called together for a special meeting in the barn. They were struck dumb with surprise when Napoleon announced that he had sold the pile of timber to Frederick. Wait, what? Yeah. Tomorrow, Frederick's wagons would arrive and begin carting it away. Throughout the whole period of his seeming friendship with Pilkington, Napoleon had really been in secret agreement with Frederick. Now, by the way, this is historically accurate. Um, Russia seemed to be an enemy of Germany and was negotiating with England, um, but then they signed a non-aggression pact with uh, Germany and invaded Poland at the same time, Germany from one side, Russia from the other, and split it down the middle. Um, and so this is an accurate representation of Stalin uh, before World War II for anybody who's interested in history. Um, all relations with Fox would have been broken off Insulting messages had been sent to Pilkington. The pigeons had been told to avoid Pinchfield Farm and to alter their slogan from death to Frederick to death to Pilkington. At the same time, Napoleon assured the animals that the stories of an impending attack on Animal Farm were completely untrue and that the tales about Frederick's cruelty to his own animals had been greatly exaggerated. All these rumors had probably originated with Snowball and his agents. It now appeared that Snowball was not, after all, hiding on Pinchfield Farm, and in fact had never been there in his life. He was living in com considerable luxury, so it was said, at Foxwood, and had in reality been a pensioner of Pilkington for years past. Another great vocab word there for you. The pigs were in ecstasies over Napoleon's cunning. By seeming to be friendly with Pilkington, he had forced Frederick to raise his price by 12 pounds. Remember, pounds is a currency of England. Um, but the superior quality of Napoleon's mind, said Squealer, was shown in the fact that he had trusted nobody, not even Frederick. Frederick had wanted to pay for the timber with something that was called a check, which it seemed was a piece of paper with a promise to pay written upon it. But Napoleon was too clever for him. He had demanded payment in real five-pound notes, which were to be handed over before the timber was removed. Already Frederick had paid up, and the sum he had paid was just enough to buy the machinery for the windmill. Meanwhile, the timber was being carted away at high speed. When it was all gone, another special meeting was held in the barn for the animals to inspect Frederick's banknotes. Smiling beatifically and wearing both his decorations, Napoleon reposed on a bed of straw on the platform with the money at his side neatly piled on a china dish from the farmhouse kitchen. The animals filed slowly past, and each gazed his fill, and Boxer put out his nose to sniff at the banknotes, and the flimsy white things stirred and rustled in his breath. Three days later, there was a terrible hullabaloo. 
Whimper, his face deadly pale, came racing up the path on his bicycle, flung it down in the yard, and rushed straight into the farmhouse. The next moment, a choking roar of rage sounded from Napoleon's apartments. The news of what had happened sped round the farm like wildfire. The banknotes were forgeries. Frederick had got the timber for nothing. And you could tell if you were paying attention because Boxer went to sniff the uh, money and it was white paper. Like, all right, this is kind of funny. It turns out that Frederick slash Hitler uh, paid Napoleon um, in Monopoly money, essentially, instead of real money. And he was too dumb to know. And so he's totally gotten it for, for nothing. Napoleon called the animals together immediately and in a terrible voice pronounced the death sentence upon Frederick. When captured, he said, Frederick should be boiled alive. At the same time, he warned them that after this treacherous deed, the worst was to be expected. Frederick and his men might make their long-expected attack at any moment. Sentinels were placed at all the approaches to the farm. In addition, four pigeons were sent to Foxwood with conciliatory message, which it was hoped might reestablish good relations with Pilkington. The very next morning, the attack came. Uh, now, this is historical, again, in the allegory, um, Nazi Germany did attack Russia. In fact, they almost took Russia. They got all the way to Moscow uh, before they were thrown back by the winter and by the arrival of um, Russian troops from the Japanese frontier. Again, lots of great historical information. If you're interested in history, it's worth looking all this stuff up and learning about it. Um, it adds to the experience of reading the book. Um, where were we? The animals were at breakfast when the lookouts came racing in with the news that Frederick and his followers had already come through the five-barred gate. Boldly enough, the animals sallied forth to meet them, but this time they did not have the easy victory that they had in the Battle of the Cowshed. There were 15 men with half a dozen guns between them, and they opened fire as soon as they got within 50 yards. The animals could not face the terrible explosions and the stinging pellets, and in spite of the efforts of Napoleon and Boxer to rally them, they were soon driven back. A number of them were already wounded. They took refuge in the farm buildings and peeped cautiously out from the chinks and knot holes. The whole of the big pasture, including the windmill, was in the hands of the enemy. For the moment, even Napoleon seemed at a loss. He paced up and down without a word, his tail rigid and twitching. Wistful glances were sent in the direction of Foxwood. If Pilkington and his men would help them, the day might yet be won. But at this moment, the four pigeons who had been sent out that day before, sorry, the day before, returned, one of them bearing a scrap of paper from Pilkington. On it was penciled the words, serves you right. Now, of course, this is this is allegorically accurate as well. The Germans took Ukraine, which was a center of Russian indu industry. The Russians had been busy industrializing their country, but they industrialized the part that was closest to Europe, and that's the part that Hitler took. Um, meanwhile, Frederick and his men had halted about the windmill. The animals watched them, and a murmur of dismay went round. Two of the men had produced a crowbar and a sledgehammer. They were going to knock the windmill down. Impossible, cried Napoleon. We have built the walls far too thick for that. They could not knock it down in a week. Courage, comrades. But Benjamin was watching the movements of the men intently. The two with the hammer and crowbar were drilling a hole near the base of the windmill. Slowly and with an air almost of amusement, Benjamin nodded his long muzzle. I thought so, he said. Do you not see what they're doing? In another minute, they're going to pack the pack blasting powder into that hole. Terrified, the animals waited. It was impossible now to venture out of the shelter of the buildings. After a few minutes, the men were seen to be running in all directions. Then there was a deafening roar. The pigeons swirled into the air, and all the animals except Napoleon flung themselves flat on their bellies and hid their faces. When they got up again, a huge cloud of black smoke was hanging where the windmill had been. Slowly, the breeze drifted it away. The windmill had ceased to exist. At this sight, the animals' courage returned to them. The fear and despair they had felt a moment earlier were drowned in their rage against this vile, contemptible act. A mighty cry for vengeance went up, and without waiting for further orders, they charged forth in a body and made straight for the enemy. This time, they did not heed the cruel pellets that swept over them like hail. Simile. It was a savage, bitter battle. The men fired again and again, and when the animals got to close quarters, lashed out with their sticks and their heavy boots. A cow, three sheep, and two geese were killed, and nearly everyone was wounded. Even Napoleon, who was directing operations from the rear, of course, had the tip of his tail chipped by a pellet. 
But the men did not go unscathed either. Three of them had their heads broken by blows from boxers' hooves. Another was gored in the belly by a cow's horn. Another had his trousers nearly torn off by Jesse and Bluebell. And when the nine dogs of Napoleon's own bodyguard, whom he instructed to make a detour under the cover of the hedge, suddenly appeared on the men's flank, baying ferociously, panic overtook them. They saw that they were in danger of being surrounded. Frederick shouted to his men to get out while the going was good, and the next moment the cowardly enemy was running for dear life. The animals chased them right down to the bottom of the field and got in some last kicks at them as they forced their way through the thorn hedge. They had won, but they were weary and bleeding. Slowly, it, they began to limp back to the farm. The sight of their dead comrades stretched upon the grass moved some of them to tears, and for a little while they halted in sorrowful silence at the place where the windmill had once stood. Yes, it was gone. Almost the last trace of their labor was gone. Even the foundations were partially destroyed, and in rebuilding it, they could not this time, as before, make use of the fallen stones. This time the stones had vanished too. The force of the explosion had flung them to distances of hundreds of yards. It was as though the windmill had never been. Remember, if the windmill represents hope, as it seems to have throughout this entire thing, what is what is the statement here? Um, as they approached the farm, Squealer, who had unaccountably been absent during the fighting, came skipping towards them, whisking his tail and beaming with satisfaction. And the animals heard, from the direction of the farm buildings, the solemn booming of a gun. What is that gun firing for? said Boxer. To celebrate our victory, cried Squealer. What victory? said Boxer. His knees were bleeding, he had lost a shoe and split his hoof, and a dozen pellets had lodged themselves in his hind leg. What victory, comrade? Have we not driven the enemy off our soil, the sacred soil of Animal Farm? But they have destroyed the windmill, and we had worked on it for two years. What? matter we'll build another windmill we will build six windmills if we feel like it you do not appreciate comrade the mighty thing that we have done the enemy was in occupation of this very ground that we stand upon and now thanks to the leadership of comrade napoleon we have won every inch of it back then we have won back what we had before said boxer that is our victory said squealer they limped into the yard the pellets under the skin of Boxer's legs smarted painfully. He saw ahead of him the heavy labor of rebuilding the windmill from the foundations, and already in imagination he braced himself for the task. But for the first time it occurred to him that he was 11 years old, and that perhaps his great muscles were not quite what they had once been. But when the animal saw the green flag flying and heard the gun firing again seven times it was fired in all, and heard the speech that Napoleon made congratulating them on their conduct, it did seem to them, after all, that they had won a great victory. The animals slain in the battle were given a solemn funeral. Boxer and Clover pulled the wagon, which served as a hearse, and Napoleon himself walked at the head of the procession. Two whole days were given over to celebrations. There were songs, speeches, and more firing of the gun, and a special gift of an apple was bestowed on every animal, with two ounces of corn for each bird and three biscuits for each dog. It was announced that the battle would be called the Battle of the Windmill, and that Napoleon had created a new decoration, the Order of the Green Banner, which he had conferred upon himself. In, general, in the general rejoicings, the unfortunate affair with the banknotes was forgotten. People were so happy about the victory that they forget that they allied with Frederick in the first place and were betrayed. Um, it was a few days later than this that the pigs came up with a case of whiskey, sorry, came upon a case of whiskey in the cellars of the farmhouse. What was that commandment that they hadn't broken yet? Hmm, I can't remember. It had been overlooked at the time when the house was first occupied. That night there came from the farmhouse the sound of a loud singing, in which to everyone's surprise the strains of beasts of England were mixed up. At about half past nine, Napoleon, wearing an old bowler hat of Mr. Jones's, was distinctly seen to emerge from the back door, gallop rapidly round the yard, and disappear indoors again. But in the morning, a deep silence hung over the farmhouse. No, not a pig appeared to be stirring. It was nearly nine o'clock when Squealer made his appearance, walking slowly and dejectedly, his eyes dull, his tail hanging limply behind him, and with every appearance of being seriously ill. He called the animals together and told them that he had a terrible piece of news to impart. Comrade Napoleon was dying. 
this is what we as, as uh, students of literature call comic relief. When you have a high tension moment, when you have a moment that's, that's really intense, you need to have a laugh. Um, and that battle with Frederick was pretty intense. Uh, you know, they blew up the windmill, things are looking pretty bad. So Orwell has put a laugh in here for us. Um, the pigs found a case of whiskey. They all got horribly drunk. Napoleon comes running out with a hat on. Now, by the way, that's breaking a commandment, right? Um, not wearing clothes, but whatever. Uh, the next morning, uh, Squealer comes out. Look at look at the description of, of the farmhouse and Squealer. A deep silence hung over the farmhouse. Not a pig appeared to be stirring. Why? They're all hung over, right? Like they all got super drunk and they're all hung over. It was nearly nine o'clock when Squealer made his appearance, walking slowly and dejectedly, his eyes dull, his tail hanging limply behind him. He's feeling sick because he got smashed last night on whiskey, right? Um, and with every appearance of being seriously ill, he looks ill because he feels sick, right? And he calls the animals together and tells them this terrible piece of news that Napoleon's dying. Napoleon's not dying. He's hung over. But, you know, what a, what a giant baby, like, he, he thinks he's dying. He's never had an experience of being drunk before. Um, you know, so that's, that's what's going on here. And, you know, maybe that's not super funny if you haven't been drunk before and none of you have. Um, but a lot of people, their first experience of alcohol is that they overindulge and then they get sick and they, they feel awful. And that's clearly what... Orwell is trying to make us all sort of have a chuckle about here. Um, let's see. A cry of lamentation went up. Straw was laid down outside the doors of the farmhouse, and the animals walked on tiptoe. With tears in their eyes, they asked one another what they should do if their leader were taken away from them. A rumor went round that Snowball had, after all, contrived to introduce poison into Napoleon's food. At 11 o'clock, Squealer came out to make another announcement. As his last act upon earth, Comrade Napoleon had pronounced a solemn decree. The drinking of alcohol was to be punished by death. You know, he hates being hung over so much that he's like, you know, anybody who drinks alcohol will die. Yeah, we'll see if that holds. By the evening, however, Napoleon appeared to be somewhat better. And the following morning, Squealer was able to tell them that he was well on his way to recovery. By the evening of that day, Napoleon was back at work. And on the next day, it was learned that he instructed Wimper to purchase in Willingdon some booklets on brewing and distilling. Brewing, of course, is the making of beer and distilling is the making of whiskey. So what is Napoleon doing here? It doesn't take a rocket science to figure it out. A week later, Napoleon gave orders at the small paddock beyond the orchard, which had previously been intended to set aside as a grazing ground for animals who were past work, was to be plowed up. It was given out that the pasture was exhausted and needed reseeding, but it soon became known that B Napoleon intended to sow it with barley. Barley is the chief ingredient in beer, in case you don't know. About this time, there occurred a strange incident which hardly anyone was able to understand. One night at about 12 o'clock, there was a loud crash in the yard, and the animals rushed out of their stalls. It was a moonlit night at the foot of of the end wall of the big barn where the seven commandments were written there lay a ladder broken in two pieces squealer temporarily stunned was sprawling beside it and near at hand there lay a lantern a paintbrush and an overturned pot of white paint the dogs immediately made a ring round squealer and escorted him back to the farmhouse as soon as he was able to walk none of the animals could form any idea as to what this meant except old benjamin who nodded his muzzle with a knowing air and seemed to understand but would say nothing but a few days later, Muriel, reading over the Seven Commandments to herself, noticed that there was yet another of them which the animals had remembered wrong. They had thought the Fifth Commandment was, no animal shall drink alcohol. But there were two words that they had forgotten. Actually, the commandment read, no animal shall drink alcohol to excess. Yeah. I'm just going to leave this chapter as it is, and uh, we'll... We'll talk about it next time, maybe.